which will be given by A.J. White today, and it's a second of two uh, <laughs> talks. Uh, one was last year, it was great success, very engaging, and this one, I guess, is a uh, time, adding time and probably more um, depth, insight, and it's uh, about Cahokia, or called actually after Cahokia, post Cahokia, um, which is evocative by your images there. Indigenous repopulation and depopulation of the Horseshoe Lake watershed, 1400 to 1900 CE. So thank you very much, AJ. We're all looking forward to it. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you for like this room, by the way. It's kind of big back. That's right. Lights on? Yeah, yeah. Is, is that our third buddy? Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to see this? I, I, I no, get the it. problem yeah. is yeah. seeing the people in the back reading. What no worries, that's, that's fine. Just, uh, so we'll wait. see uh, if, um, do you, if you want to, is it, you need light up here? It's, it's very, yeah, it's, this is great. More light? Yeah, no, that's perfect. I was trying to, uh, all right. Sorry to start off uh, uh, about the light thing. Anyway, yeah, my name is AJ. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Um, as discussed, um, I am doing sort of a follow-up to what I discussed last year. Um, I had been thinking I might be able to, to speak a little bit as I transition to Lisa's project in Jordan, but I don't have anything yet that will keep you in your seats. So I will return to Cahokia, uh, like the sequel. Okay, so um, just to provide some background to those who weren't there or who aren't uh, particularly up on Mississippi and archeology, span Cahokia is one of the most significant archeological sites we have in our country. Um, more than anything, just for its size, um, here is its location at a continental scale. And uh, if we zoom in, it's located on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River, um, about a 20 minute drive from modern day St. Louis. Um, and what's most notable about the site are its, uh, it, its, its huge quantity of these massive monumental mounds. What's shown here is Monk's Mound, which is the largest of them, I think you can get an idea by the scale with those trees of just how big this thing is. It's the largest uh, pre-contact earthwork in all of North America. And so it's just a very visually impressive site. And the general narrative that's been established by decades of archaeological work here is that uh, around the 10th century CE, uh, people really came to this one location in great numbers. And uh, what I mean by Mississippian, by the way, is the uh, sort of cultural and temporal designation of uh, associated archeological sites up and down the Mississippi River Valley that were occupied between 1000 and 1400 CE. Um, anyhow, in the 11th century, you had this population maximum, which some people estimate reached tens of thousands of people. So this was a city. You have to think of it as just being this bustling place. Um, but uh, within, uh, on the order of decades, it began a population decline that was particularly severe, and it um, continued to decline all the way to 1400 CE, which is where we have this minimum, and that's sort of where the book closes, and the archaeologists pack up their bags and say, okay, that's, that's Cahokia, and that's where the story stops. Now, we as an archaeological community have been particularly um, interested in this Mississippian, Mississippian decline, and the way that we describe it uh, often involves sometimes rather harsh, harsh terminology. So we talk about degradation, decline, bust, collapse, abandonment, words that imply a degree of finality. And when these terms are sort of interpreted by popular science works and the larger media, and sometimes it gets romanticized. And so the story becomes this long lost sight um, of this city, what happened to them when Europeans arrived, there was no one there. What caused this ghost town? And um, our fixation on the decline um, might lead to some bad things, um, such as terminal narratives and um, the idea of the disappearing Indian, for example. So I wasn't familiar with this body of work um, until last spring when I took a class with Dr. Lightfoot, as well as Jari and Trent and Mike. Um, and this was on the archaeology of colonialism. Uh, one of the things that we read that I was particularly drawn to was the work of Michael Wilcox out of Stanford, who um, in his book, The Pueblo Revolt and the Mythology of Conquest, um, established these ideas rather nicely, and I, and I wanted to share some of uh, his, his thoughts with you. Um, so he defines terminal narratives as accounts of enduring histories which explain the absence, cultural death, or disappearance of indigenous peoples. 
he uh, goes on to say that most of the information communicated to the public about indigenous peoples is associated with destruction and disappearance. And he elaborates further that conquest narratives, disease, cultural and demographic collapse, acculturation and assimil assimilation are sort of what end up being associated with indigenous peoples today, which obviously is not the full picture because there's millions of Native Americans um, despite all this emphasis on decline and disappearance. So it's possible that we have a problem on our hands sort of as archeologists and how we, we tend to fixate on declines because you know, they are interesting. Um, so last year I presented on some of the data that I had obtained in my master's work at Cahokia. And what did I do? I, uh, I talked about the decline. <laughs> so um, I, I might've been um, part of the problem in a certain sense. Um, now, I'm not trying to argue that we should just ignore these important demographic events. Um, rather, I think that we can learn a whole lot from them. To summarize what I talked about last year around this time, um, we came to the interpretation that there are several uh, environmental uh, changes that manifested themselves in um, increased large flooding events and a change in the, the timing of rainfall from uh, mostly occurring in the summer to then occurring in, in the winter, which um, uh, you need summer rain to, to grow maize uh, crops, so um, that was detrimental to the groups. And so that sort of those environmental problems in association with political, economic, and other social things may have um, contributed to this decline that we see. So that's what I talked about. But I ended it right around 1400. And so after you know taking Dr. Leitzer's class and kind of thinking about these terminal narratives and stuff, it was kind of crazy that I had data from 800 CE to the present, but I truncated it right at 1400, almost like unconsciously. I just said, you know, like, well, this is where everyone's looking, you know, is, is it the Mississippian period? So that's what I'll talk about. Um, so I think it's kind of easy. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm just starting off and I kind of wanted to do what everyone else is doing. I'm not sure, but I definitely did sort of without thinking, just immediately fixate on this decline. But I have, you know, uh, over 500 years of data that uh, we're just kind of sitting there. So that's what I'd like to talk about today, um, is uh, the, uh, the, the leftover data, which is actually quite important. Um, and I'd like to sort of try to take up Dr. Wilcox on this challenge, um, which I think he presents to all of us, which is what if archeologists were asked to explain the continued presence of the semi communities 500 years after Columbus instead of their disappearance or marginality? So, um, I don't know how well I'll be able to, to get at that completely, but we can start at least by taking a look at what happens after Cahokia, and maybe that will get us a little bit closer to, uh, to that goal. So uh, that's what I'd like to do for the rest of our presentation. And um, before getting too much into that though, I'd like to kind of give an explanation on how we obtain that data. I went over this in depth last year. I'd still like to touch on it so that people who weren't present will get an idea, but I'd like to do it in a slightly different way. Um, but just uh, first, in terms of where we obtained the uh, sediment for uh, our, our data, we went to Horseshoe Lake, which is located just outside of the, the boundary, as um, noted by the extent of the mounds, basically, of Cahokia. And um, I got sediment from a previously obtained core um, by a colleague, Horm 12, and then went out and also collected a core. And between these two cores, we um, looked at pollen data, we looked at uh, charcoal, um, uh, the, the um, core was uh, dated with nine radiocarbon dates, and um, I particularly focused on changes in fecal molecules over time, uh, with the idea being that changes in their concentration related to the amount of people present on this watershed. And so to explain a little bit more about that, I was hoping I could get uh, a volunteer from the audience, maybe someone who uh, is adventurous and eats meat, doesn't mind potty humor. Um, anybody, any, maybe any my buds in the back? Uh, no, okay, yeah. You, yeah, there we go, yeah, 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 yeah. Give, it, give it up for Danny, everybody. All right, so, um, all right, so, Danny. Where do I stand? Right there's time for now. Um, so I have a uh, laboratory tube and uh, some uh, reading material. Our bathroom is just through the atrium and to the left. What do you need, like five minutes? Is that okay? Do I need to drink water? No, no, you 
just uh, so you just come back when you're through. Okay. No, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I wasn't sure how that would work, but I want to give it a try. <laughs> uh, so um, instead, uh, you're okay eating meat, right? Yes. Okay. So we have some jerky. This is the good stuff. It's Whole Foods. Um, it's like eight bucks. So. Nice. Uh, yeah. So why don't you uh, grab and and enjoy a piece of jerky? Okay. So go go for it there. Um, anyway, so um, so Danny has just obtained. Um, oh, there you go. There's a whole basket. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much, man. All right. Uh, so um, Danny has just uh, obtained some meat, right? Which is sub sustaining his body for your own metabolism purposes, but it also is sustaining um, billions of other organisms that are inside of your gut, as well as all of our guts. And so what's happening is that they are um, sort of taking a piece of the pie, not literally in this case, taking a piece of the jerky um, for their own um, uh, needs. And um, they're very good at breaking down almost anything. And so they can take cholesterol molecules, which are in that meat because um, you know meat uh, of any sort of source will contain cholesterol, and they can break it down partially. And so they start off with cholesterol, and they take um, a small part of the cholesterol apart, but they can't break it down because cholesterol is a very rigid molecule. It's a lot more complex than a carbohydrate or just a, a fat chain. And so what they produce is something called paprosinol, which is now a different molecule than cholesterol. And so right now, Danny is making, or I should say Danny's <laughs> organisms are making some caprosinol. Now, do you need caprosinol? Do you have anything that you can get out of it? I Probably not. It's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> you didn't get anything out of it. Uh, it's, it's a waste product to the microbes, so it goes out. And we'll just leave it there. The R question is just to the left. Um, now, if um, let's pretend, Danny, that you were here like 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where would you go to the bathroom? Right where I'm standing. Right where I'm standing. Okay, that's correct. So, if this, so let's say that this is 4,000 years ago. Here's where the ark was. And here's the bay. Right? And we're on a slope, as in this is this is going west. And so if this is where Danny was, he was to do his business right here. Don't, 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 please. Um, but if you're going to do that, um, the idea is that some of that caprosinol would eventually get washed in after rain event. It would partially dissolve and collect in some sort of catchment. In this case, the ultimate catchment of the world is the, the ocean, right? And so it, it would enter some sort of catchment. It would, it would get buried and deposited. And once it's down there, um, it can persist for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, the reason that is is because it is now in a form that's uh, not attractive to other microbes. The microbes in your belly took off the easy part of the molecule. And what's left is, is this very complex molecule. If they were to try to break it down, they'd only get the tiniest amount of energy in return. And so it's basically ignored. So microbes eventually will get um, uh, desperate enough to, to perhaps eat it at some point, but it's only after most other um, uh, molecules have been exhausted. And so we can um, identify this molecule um, you know, in an old context, and that's what makes it of use to archaeology. So, thank you, Danny. You're welcome to have that jerky. Thank you for. Um, <laughs> um, there we get a little hand for being with us. Now, if we were to plot, um, if we were to plot the concentration that we have of of proposal over time. If this was concentration, and this was, um, let's say, this was the present. And this is going back in time. Um, our data would look something like this. And this is basically a uh, decay curve, which is to say that although a lot of the um, caprosinol still persists, some of it does degrade and go away. And so that makes it hard to distinguish small changes that you might say here that might actually impact um, significant changes in the regional population. To, to account for this, we present our data as a ratio of caprosinol to something called 5-alpha uh, cholesterol. And um, what 5-alpha cholesterol is, is the breakdown product of cholesterol 
outside of the human gut, by the more common route that uh, microbes break it down into. And so what we have is a ratio of what's happening from uh, more of a sort of human-derived um, presence to what's sort of the background sort of environmental presence. And um, that makes it easier to see sort of changes, because 5-alpha cholesterol is decaying at a similar rate. And so at any given time, if, this, if these two curves are closer, that would suggest that there might be more uh, people in the environment uh, than at a time where they're further apart. So um, just want to give you that background. Um, so thanks again, Danny. You're the mayor. I owe you one. Um, now, this method is not foolproof at all. Um, the most notable setback regarding it is that other animals we know can produce it as well. If you look at this graph, um, Caprosinol is shown in blue. The first thing that you note is that uh, humans produce it overwhelmingly more than um, other animals that we've tested. So we are the dominant producer of this as far as we know. Um, but you can see that you know, things like maybe pigs or cows or cats even um, can produce maybe a tenth of what we make, but that could be significant. So how do we know that we're not looking at a city of cats? As fun as that would be, <laughs> right? Um, um, and we don't. So that's the end of my lecture. Uh, it's just Cahokia, it's just, it just a cat city. Um, no, um, no, but we, we can use a process of elimination. So in um, pre-contact North America, um, uh, large domesticates like cows and pigs simply weren't present. So we don't have that problem. You know, there still could be the occasional possum and stuff, but we make the assumption that this is a background input that's relatively constant throughout time. And that since we know that there were major changes in the amount of people uh, in the watershed, that that is what's kind of driving changes in, in the, um, the fecal scale record that we have. So um, I, I will leave that to you, how much you want to take, um, to uh, have confidence in these data, but I just wanted to be upfront about that. So let's have a look at our data. Um, this is sort of where I presented to last year. And um, the, the two different um, points, the one's gray with squares, one black with, uh, with circles, those represent the two different uh, cores that we uh, tested from in the lake. And um, the maximum uh, around 1,000 is where we'd expect it based on that uh, narrative that I just told you about in terms of the population history of Cahokia. And we also get a minimum about where we expect it um, at 1,400. And we actually use that um, correlation to uh, sort of uh, justify the utility of this method as something that other people should try. So um, once we get past here, we're kind of into unknown territory. There's very little uh, evidence as to what was going on in the area. Um, and so we kind of just have to... Um, you know, make some guesses as to what might have happened next. Um, so we know that at the time of European contact um, and um, settlement around the 17, early 1700s, um, there was a small um, population of um, uh, uh, Illinois, um, of the Illinois people, um, particularly a subgroup of that tribe called the Cahokia. And so that um, group actually gave its name to Cahokia the site. That's going to be confusing, and I'll do my best to distinguish between when I'm talking about Cahokia as a people or Cahokia as a site, um, because there's several hundred years of difference between those. Um, but anyway, so what we might expect is something like this, where you have this kind of period, like several hundred years where no one's there, and then we have the Europeans arrive, and it kind of picks up. That's not what we see. Um, instead, the abandonment of Cahokia was short-lived. Um, we find a rebound within 100 years uh, going off these air bars. Um, and by the 1600s, and I have this kind of, this area is blown up right there. By the mid 1600s, there's a sort of local maximum. Uh, I can see that it, it is modest. Um, it's not nearly the sort of uh, magnitude that we're looking at when Tokyo was at its, its height. But nonetheless, it is a, a reversal of that famous decline. Um, so this is important for several reasons. Um, one is we can completely attribute it to um, an indigenous repopulation. I'm not going to speculate too much as to the, um, the heritage of, of those who did come back. Um, it is thought that um, the people most associated with the Mississippian occupation of Gokia ended up going south towards the Gulf, and that um, those that were uh, associated with the Illinois were coming in from the northeast. Um, but because it is before um, 
European newly arrived here, we know that this is being controlled by a, um, uh, by a Native American um, sort of signature, I guess you could say. Um, and that that population max is reached before Europeans arrive. Um, so we have this um, sort of new repopulation story to tell. Now, what's the European arrival time? Um, so the first European to come through this area was Marquette in 1670. But the first Europeans to actually stay in this area was just after 1700 with a French mission that was established about eight miles to the south of Cahokia as a site. Um, and I'll, I'll get into sort of the historic period a little bit more um, as we go on. Um, so, um, all right, so I'll just go out and say it. Um, that repopulation that I just um, showed or interpreted is not supported by archaeological evidence. So when I looked into um, uh, the academic um, sort of literature in this area, there's very little if, that I can find at all about what happened after the Mississippian occupation at Cahokia. So I started to turn to CRM data and um, contacted the Illinois State Museum. They very nicely provided me a, um, the records of sites within a three mile radius of the lake, which approximates the lake's watershed. And um, here's what we find. Um, there's a ton of lake woodland, which is the period right before the Mississippian, and Mississippian sets, just, just a, a whole ton of them. Uh, a handful of upper Mississippian, which is getting close to 1400, and then absolutely nothing, nothing for protohistoric at all. I was shocked, because I thought there, there must be something there, but I couldn't find a single site that dated to this time period where we had this repopulation I, I'm, I'm arguing for in the, in the 1500s into the 1600s. So what's going on here? Uh, it looks like we have this gap in the archeology, span and that gap is solidified in the chronology. So if you look at the most recent chronology of the area, uh, presented by Fortier et al., um, that time period where I suggest that there was a repopulation is a unnamed black hole in the chronology, <laughs> which I think makes you think there's gonna be nothing there, you know, if, if it's as official as, you know, a, a, a black hole in the chronology. So to investigate this, I, I decided to start with what we knew, and I guess you could say that I did a, uh, used a direct historical analogy, which I believe is a euphemism for the direct historical approach, <laughs> which I learned last year I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> so, so it's not that, it's a direct historical analogy. Um, so we started with, uh, so what we know is that, yeah, what I was mentioning earlier that, um, there was a uh, Illinois village basically right in the region where the, the Cahokia site is um, at the tail end of the, uh, the 17th century. Um, and this is this map provided by Morrissey. Uh, Morrissey's a historian, but note that it's interesting that he hypo hypothesized a proto-Illinois migration route that comes right by here in the 1500s. Um, that's not necessarily backed up by uh, archeological evidence, but I wonder if the, um, the fecal stanal data might uh, uh, work with that. So something I want to say. So we know that there's something there. So let's talk a little bit about the Illinois. Um, the Illinois um, had a very different subsistence strategy than Mississippian groups. So they were semi-sedentary, unlike the Illinois who were, were in one spot building, you know, uh, massive uh, mounds in, in many cases. Um, and so um, the Illinois practiced agriculture in the spring and fall. Um, and so they were doing some farming, but during the summer they engaged in mobile um, bison hunts that took them far away from where they were farming. Um, and then during the winter they'd break into smaller groups and um, they, would, um, they would have small hunting camps over the winter. So what I take from that is that for an equally sized Mississippian group and an Illinois group, um, the Illinois group is likely producing less archaeological material because they're not in the same spot for, this, for as much time as a Mississippian group. So there might be just less stuff um, from an Illinois occupation compared to a Mississippian one. Additionally, Illinois sites rarely contain diagnostic material. Um, I have a picture here of some um, uh, relatively undiagnostic uh, bifaces from a site that don't give a lithicist a whole lot to work with for a typology. Um, and when you compare that with uh, Mississippian sites, you know, with a, a fair amount of um, 
more diagnostic ceramics and things like that. And so that leads me to conclude that the identification of Illinois sites is difficult, uh, particularly when you're working in like the Mississippi Valley where there's like almost no such thing as a surface find. And I mean, I've, I've spent most of my um, time in archaeology in the desert, and so coming to swampland, I was like, how does people get anything done unless you can see a, a hundred foot tall mound, <laughs> right? And so that's a little more obvious than perhaps this. So all this leads me to propose a possible Mississippian bias that might be ongoing. So I wonder if everything is telling you that there's only Mississippian sites in this area, if you were to find a lithic scatter without diagnostic material, when you're filling out the site record form, would you be tempted to just check off Mississippian? Because that's what it's supposed to be. Um, and this is a problem that hasn't been, um, has been raised in other parts of the world. I was reading a paper uh, in Belgium uh, about a, um, a Germanic bias, with the idea being that um, the history says that by the late Roman, end of the Roman Empire, they had pulled out and it was all sites from that time period are Germanic. But this author was saying, no, no, we need to reevaluate this. There are late Roman sites here. We're just not identifying them as such. So I wonder if a similar process might be occurring um, in this area that would sort of shift everything earlier in time, uh, particularly if there's not that much diagnostic material available. Um, so that might be, that's sort of my interpretation of what might be going on for that um, uh, difference between what the fecal stamens are showing and what the archaeology is showing. Now I'd like to get some possible explanations for why uh, people um, came to this area uh, in the 1500s. Um, and since we're looking at cores, we have a fair amount of paleoenvironmental proxies. Um, and what I interpret is that um, the population rebounded during a pretty significant ecological transition in this area, um, which I would like to point out um, by having you look at the increase in um, grass pollen counts uh, associated with an increase in charcoal counts that occur right when we have our population high. So um, I remind you that um, the Illinois were engaged in bison hunts. And so if we return to this map that we saw earlier, here's a projected um, bison range in the 1500s that goes actually past Cahokia. So Illinois is at an ecotone between grasslands to the uh, west and woodlands to the east. And that, that boundary would shift. So if we have a shift towards grasslands, allowing habitat for bison to come in, that might be a suitable um, area to visit if that is something that you uh, are engaging with um, as part of your, your subsistence strategy. So um, it's quite possible that um, we have um, bison hunting, bringing people coming in, possibly some management through uh, charcoal, uh, which I guess you can hear a lot more about this week <laughs> if you'd like to. Um, but that, that um, coincidence, I think, uh, is suggestive. Um, to say the least. Um, I also threw in some um, uh, oxygen isotope uh, data here. I think it's less strong, so I'll just make a very brief mention that um, the population maximum is bounded by uh, negative excursions in Delta 18, which we interpret to mean less uh, summer rainfall, um, which would, is not good for um, maize agriculture, as I said. So it, it could be too that if you were looking to do some farming as well, this wouldn't be a bad time to do it. I'm not proposing as much if that's a, a big reason for why someone would be here. But since I have the data, I might as well use it, I guess, um, or put it up there. So, um, so I do think that that's a potential reason for why people could have uh, come to this area at that time. So now let's kind of look at this second half of the, um, the population proxy. And looking at how we have a decline, there is a outlier. I'm not really sure how to explain that. but. In general, you see the trend from about the late 1600s towards the present, it's gonna getting negative. Uh, and so what I've tried to do in this graph is um, at the top um, show various historical events um, that happened in relation to this population decline, which I'll discuss right now. Um, so the orange um, uppermost uh, rectangles relate to historic events of um, uh, Cahokia, which is a subgroup of Illinois groups, um, so not the site, uh, people living there, uh, I'm, I'm uh, interpreting in the late 1600s and, and onward. Um, 
The purple rectangles are historic events of European groups. Um, and the uh, yellow um, rectangles are Eastern North American epidemics, um, which we can talk about. Uh, so to put some context to this, let's start by looking at, I'm sorry, these are really tiny numbers. If you can't see in the back, I'll try my best to point out what I'm referring to. This large orange rectangle at the top um, refers to a period of intermittent warfare um, and skirmishes by Illinois groups um, in a very complicated series of alliances, both with other native groups and then during the time of European arrival, primarily allied with the French actually against um, British and other native groups. It was, it was incredibly complex what was going on here. And so we had a long period of warfare um, that started actually before European arrival um, uh, and, um, and continued all the way up to 1800 or so. So obviously that would involve a degree of population loss through warfare. However, warfare at this time was very based on, um, it, on, on taking slaves as sort of a way to sort of re refill the population. So it was complicated because although there was population loss through death, there was also raids that brought people in. And so it's possible that this plateau that we see for a while might be associated with that. that you know, so warfare isn't a straightforward down. It's kind of down, but kind of comes back up at times too. Um, uh, in terms of where um, the Cahokia people are, um, they were moving around. And so um, there was originally a village about eight miles south of Cahokia in a city called Cahokia, <laughs> to make it even more complicated. <laughs> um, and um, by the mid-1700s, they moved up to Horseshoe Lake. And the French established a mission on top of Monk's Mound, and that's been excavated. Um, but there's no archaeological evidence of that, of that uh, Cahokia village, which I think um, helps um, support my idea that if, this, uh, if there was an Illinois presence there, it's hard to find archaeologically. We have historical evidence of there being an entire village in the area of Cahokia, and despite all the decades of archaeological work, no one's identified it. Um, so I think that could um, perhaps uh, help interpret that interpretation. Uh, I think I said interpret the interpretation. That's it. Um, anyway, um, so um, and just uh, so I have a, a scattering of some sort of historical things to mention. Um, so we had um, basically intermittent French involvement through um, um, largely missionary involvement in the uh, early half of the 1700s. But by the end of the 1700s, we had more settlers coming who were there to come in bigger numbers. So European population um, really didn't come become a, a major. Um, def demographic concern until almost the Euro-American period uh, when people really started to arrive from the, uh, from the east of, of, Euro of European descent. Um, so the last thing to consider too is there were multiple significant um, uh, epidemics around this time. Uh, you'll note that um, I have an epidemic plotted from uh, the 1520s and the 1530s and the 80s um, uh, scholars such as Dobbins and, and Dunnell had hypothesized that um, in the 16th century there was this massive um, population loss through disease that spread throughout the continent. It was continental in scale. I don't think that our data supports that because we have a population increase during that time period. However, when we get into this period and we do have a decline, there were a lot of um, almost within a decade, you know, multiple epidemics occurring. So what I'd like to suggest is that um, although there is a decline, I think it's very complicated. And often I think scholars attribute it to, oh, it's just disease, oh, it's just warfare. But I think what we're seeing is a mixture of disease, warfare, and also just people moving around. So if I used an environmental um, explanation for why people might have come, you'll notice that the grasslands recede and the charcoal recedes and, and, and whatnot. Um, with that decline as well. So perhaps it also wasn't um, environmentally conducive um, to staying in that region as well. So um, taking all of those together, it's possible that we have this very complicated story that's not you know, attributed to one thing that's um, very active on the part of the Native Americans themselves. They're just moving um, away uh, in, in, in a certain sense. So I think that could also be um, part of this story. So. Um, Getting into um, the last couple slides that I have prepared for us today, um, when I 
was reading, I, uh, in, in um, getting prepared for this, I read some pretty scary stuff. Um, a lot of it was out of history, but some stuff that I, I really kind of shocked me. Um, I, I read um, a particular quote that said, today the Illini tribe is culturally extinct. That was the last sentence of the entire article. Um, that's ridiculous uh, because um, there is a, uh, a, a tribe today, the Para tribe of Indians of Oklahoma, who um, in the 1800s, um, they moved to Oklahoma, um, and they were one um, branch of the Illinois, um, just like the Cahokia were, and they incorporated a lot of other Illinois people. And um, this is a tribe that's thriving today. They are engaged with NAGPRA in Illinois. They're consulted with uh, in projects in this area. They have uh, members living in this area. Um, and so um, what I hope um, we might be able to do is to um, look at the following. So I'd like to say that regional depopulation and relocation, although I think is documented, uh, do not equate to cultural extinction, which has been done. Um, the indigenous depopulation of the watershed shouldn't be interpreted as Native American disappearance, but rather Native American persistence through warfare, disease, environmental change, and political developments, which all were a very complicated um, uh, set of, um, of uh, variables that were at play. So uh, to <coughs> conclude my talk, I'd like to leave you with the following um, takeaways. Uh, one is that uh, the fecal snail data indicate that the Cahokia region supported an indigenous population, I argue. Um, I know it's based primarily on a single data set, but I would, I would like to at least put it out there. Um, following the decline, despite a lack of archaeological evidence and research emphasis on um, being placed on Mississippian occupations. Additionally, the repopulation of the watershed uh, coincided with environmental changes, uh, which might have been conducive to Illinois subsistence strategies, and may have contributed to a pre tontac population that I'm saying is somewhere around the mid-1600s. Um, additionally, a complicated series of movements, warfare, environmental change, and epidemics in the 18th century most likely led to an indigenous depopulation of the area, but by acknowledging that there was a population rebound following Mississippi in decline, we might be moving closer to a narrative of uh, native persistence instead of native uh, disappearance. So thank you very much. And I'd be uh, interested to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm wondering about the um, deposition, we'll call it, of the uh, cholesterol uh, breakdown products. And if there are different cultures living there, like the original Sure, uh, that's a, a very fair question um, about, you know, um, we have a group of people coming with very dis different subsistence strategy, um, which probably meant that they were not there as often as a Mississippian group would have been. Um, I'd first like to say that that rebound that I uh, identified is modest. It's not a um, huge bump comparable to what we're seeing at Cahokia. It is, I think, more than zero. And so what I'm trying to say is that uh, it indicates a presence. I don't think that this is perhaps a large presence, but it's possible that there could have been farming um, activity in that area, which would have led to people um, perhaps farming in the, in the floodplain um, near the lake, uh, which um, we know happened in Mississippi in time, so it could have certainly happened later as well. Um, and additionally, I mean, perhaps there could have been hunting camps in the area where the, the quantity of these molecules would be lower 
but I think it could be there still. So we're still saying, you know, although it's not many people, it's not for a very long time, I still think that could be something to register on this methodology that I presented. Yes? Thank you very much. Can I add on to your discussion uh, on this? Uh -huh. uh, two things. One, in your course, you should be able to track maize, and because maize doesn't move, it right. would be in the watershed if it was grown near there, so you should see it in the, the maize pollen, I should say, sorry. You should see it in the course, mm -hmm. and you should be able to follow if it dies out or if they continue growing maize there in your later time periods. You should be able to track that pretty straightforwardly. And the other thing is, are you aware of today or any evidence in the cores of wild rice? Because wild rice occurred in lakes all was, was, was moved. It's not wild, but they call it wild. It's wild in the sense that it can grow by itself without people planting it like maize. But it starts in the eastern seaboard, right? In sort of Ottawa, Canada area. And by the time Europeans arrive, it's in all the lakes across the greater um, northern yeah. area. And I don't know if it's in Horseshoe Lake mm -hmm. or it grows there, but if it was, it's the kind of thing you could go, one would go there, the Illinois would go there and harvest in the fall. Okay. So if there's any evidence of wild rice today or in the course. Right, I, I, I should um, state, so that, that's a great, you know, like in terms of looking for more evidence to support this idea through pollen. Mm -hmm. um, the pollen data is not my own, um, so I am dangerously coming at it without uh, a whole lot of knowledge. Um, and so uh, I kind of focused in on grass because I was interested no, no, in that. No, but corn's unique. Absolutely. So you should be able to use that if they've reported. <coughs> that they, is there any? Right. I, what needs to happen, I think, is I need to go back and look at the data. So that's just more on me not looking than necessarily not being there. Because it doesn't move. That's the philosophy, that if it's grown in a catchment, it ends up in a lake. It doesn't go through the air. It doesn't move really far. So if it's in your pollen core, mm -hmm. which it should be during the Mississippian times, for sure. Uh -huh. So the question is, how, how, how does it track in your later time periods? I will, I will look at that. <laughs> I'll talk to the person who knows how to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Junko. So in terms of your climatic and change data, and do you have any possible explanation of how that may have been related to population increase and decrease? I mean, um, aridity, that itself doesn't explain much in relation to subsistence factors. Almost looks like, you know, you were in bringing in the data, but you didn't really explain how sure. that may happen. Yeah, so if we just kind of jump back to there. Um, so I, I probably shouldn't even put this on this uh, graph. So let's just throw delta 18 out for a second. Um, but if we look to the charcoal and the, the grass pond, <coughs> what I would like to argue is that uh, this to me indicates a uh, increase in grass, which I'm interpreting as perhaps more just of grassland, okay. um, which is the, the habitat for bison. And so the idea being that um, that in association with increased burning through increased charcoal might suggest that there was burning practices associated with bison hunting, which would be something that would be evidence of people being there. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm getting at. Uh, that's a case maybe climate is not uh, appropriate. What you're talking about human impacts on the environment, right? I am, but I'm also talking about an extension of grassland yeah. Which so I is think that because of uh, climate change or because of human impact, and you just said that it's because of burning. I I think that they're happening together. So okay. I think that you have grass opening up, uh -huh. creating an extension of habitat, which I'm saying is more environmental. Uh -huh. And then once that provides that opportunity to be exploited, then the management coming in. You know, okay. and so so they, they happen together. But I think it is both environmental and human. Um, in my interpretation. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Yeah. I, I, just, I think you probably need to clarify that part and uh, from what I can see, if uh. the climate change was occurring at the same time, then the charcoal data itself is not good enough. You need some backup data. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll keep looking. Very good. How you're going to build your argument. Okay. <laughs>
Yes, Dr. So, Lundberg. So, AJ, so when does a mission come in? The first French mission, is it the 1700s? Yeah, around 1700s. So it's, so it's interesting in looking at this. When the Franciscans here in Alta California, when they came in, there was a lot of evidence of native burning. And then they basically put out a policy of prohibiting burning. Mm -hmm. And essentially within their areas that they control with the Spanish soldiers, they essentially stopped native peoples from burning. And so there's some major changes that go on. It's not, it's not related to the environment per se, mm -hmm. but it's related to these uh, colonial uh, <clears throat> programs that get put into place. I just wonder, because I, mean, I don't know about the French and how they operated, but a lot of these missions that had, especially agricultural programs, tended not to like to have people burning out of the hinterland. Uh -huh. It was one of the worst things that could happen if you had livestock and other things like that. So they oftentimes would prohibit. You know, I just wonder, you know, if that, that's a pretty marked decline there. I just kind of wonder if, you're, if you've got a situation where the, the French have moved in and they're now aggregating some of these native peoples into the mission and whether there's some real changes going on in terms of, because again, they're all trying to acculturate, they're trying to change the native life ways to begin with, but they also didn't want burning once they got these agricultural infrastructure put into place. So I just wonder if there's a relationship there or, you know, if you could go back and actually look at the French documents and see if they had, you know, in terms of policies about native burning. All right. Yeah. Does anyone speak French? <laughs> the old man. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.